Welcome everybody to our first of the year coaches workshop. Um, we're going to turn it right over to Eric Leitner and let him get started. We'll be talking about streaming and yes, we are recording and this will be available on our website later this evening for those that did not get a chance to make it tonight. All right. Thanks, Tammy. And hello, everyone. I know, I think everyone here, I believe, have met via this sort of, you know, way, but I know the three people at the bottom there at the screen really, really well. Um, so I, I will introduce myself for Carolyn just in case, but uh, I'm Eric Leitner. I'm the VP of SSEL. I, I'm also uh, a former, and, you know, I miss them very much, uh, employee of Lisa's and worked with Belinda and Wanda uh, in Broward schools with the Broward STEM department. And um, now I work with Clever Like Studios as a content producer. Uh, and Clever Like is a partner with NASAF. So this just keeps kind of all coming together like completely, right? So even Brian uh, at Clever Like was like, oh no, go do that. That's awesome. They'll love it. So, you know, so er everyone loves to make these things happen. We love to make these things happen. So our focus tonight was, of course, on specifically on streaming. Um, I want to preface this uh, by saying that, um, one, there are like a million ways to do this. So do not take whatever I'm going to create as gospel. I just want to give kind of pointers to get things started, um, to make sure you at least know where to look, what software to run, what settings to kind of just get things set up. Um, and why we make some of the choices we make when streaming, specifically in Scholastic Esports. Uh, so, for example, uh, obviously we'll use, since it's a big focus of what we're doing, Rocket League as the game we're going to use as an example today. Um, we're going to use YouTube as the platform. We talked about this a little bit in our last meeting, that YouTube, YouTube has some really good uh, content controls, especially around... Um, what we can set for specifically for children to limit ads, to limit communication that we don't want and things like that, and to help control that space a little bit better, even when live streaming. Because um, to be honest, one of the hard things about live streaming uh, before you get good at it is how do I monitor things like chats and things like that, while at the same time, running a game and working video controls and all sorts of things. Uh, you can't do all of it at once. You know, a lot of these ones that you see on TV, they've got production teams and things like that that are running all of this. And they're still using this software uh, that we're gonna use tonight, which is OBS Studio. Um, now, again, I don't want to, and I'll share my screen here. I don't want, again, anyone to think that OBS Studio or any of these is, uh, I do wanna make sure I'm sharing the right screen. You see the OBS Studio? Nope, that's the wrong screen. Let's try that again uh this screen otherwise i'm just sharing an infinite loop of zoom is it sharing why am i not seeing a box i can't hear you tammy you're muted do you see the obs we video got you. go ahead okay good okay good and i I'm, was like I'm driving myself crazy in the chat okay cool cool um so we do want to um I do want to preface again that this is not the be all end all of all of this whatsoever um there are like a million programs. OBS Studio, however, is one that is used commonly both uh, by streamers uh, and industry professionals. It is open source. Uh, there is no cost involved. There is no login involved. Um, and it's pretty much what every other streaming software is built upon. Uh, you may run into issues with your district. For example, Tammy did where they didn't like the idea of open source software being used because admittedly, and I understand OB, open, uh, open end software can be nefarious in that if it's free, who knows what is in the underlying code, if you will, but uh, this is a very trusted piece of software. But if that is a concern, uh, the really good alternative for that is one called Streamlabs OBS, and you can go to streamlabs.com for that one. The big difference between these two is what the Streamlabs team has done is basically taken OBS software because it's open source and turned it into a platform um, that is no longer open source and added a marketplace to it, meaning you can purchase assets and things like that for your stream. So graphics, overlays, um, plugins, and things like that. Um, so they've monetized it in that sense. Um, so pick your battles. Would you <laughs> Do you want to avoid marketplace experiences? Uh, or do you want to avoid open source software? Now, again, there are yet more alternatives. YouTube does have its own built-in streaming software. It's not great. It's bare bones. It's very simple. Um, 
it's nothing that the industry would ever actually use, but for individual users, it's it gets the job done if that's all you need. Um, there's also uh, Twitch, of course, has its own um, platform for this as well. That is still very much in beta, so I don't know how stable or you know how many tools are built into that. I started um, using it this past week, and it it's, is very basic. It is very basic right now. And my understanding is there are some elements of it that are still a little buggy. So you get some frame rate issues and things mm -hmm. like that, depending on what you're sharing. Uh, and then there's one even called StreamYard. Uh, StreamYard has a free option, but also has paid options. It's entirely a web-based OBS. So you don't need to install any software. You do it right from your browser. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is you get some loss in your stream the same way you do if you were in a Zoom call. So <laughs> um, it's not perfect. Uh, it gets the job done for slower paced games, I've noticed. So sharing your Minecraft screens, for example, in StreamYard works totally fine. Sharing something very fast paced and with a lot of audio like Rocket League does not work fine. Um, I've I've had very choppy streams using StreamYard to stream games like Rocket League. So it's not ideal. It's doable, especially if people just want to kind of see what's happening. Uh, but it's not going to give you the best experience. So I am going to stick with stream, uh, stream uh, OBS Studio rather, not Streamlabs tonight, OBS Studio. And if you need OBS Studio, you can download it for free at obsproject.com. Uh, that is where that's available. You would literally just choose your platform and install it. And that's it. There's no login. There's no sign up. The only thing they ever ask for financially is a contribution. Uh, you can also even go to their GitHub if you want to see their underlying code and things like that. They give it away for free because it is all open source digging too deep into that. Okay, we're not gonna open OBS just yet, although I do have it open already. The first thing we're gonna actually go into is um, the game. Uh, and I wanna open up the game. So uh, I have mine in Steam. Some of you have it in the Epic Launcher. Uh, it depends on when you got it for the most part, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and open it in Steam. Uh, so let me do that. And while that's opening, the reason I want to open the game is there are settings if you're going to stream, you have to change in your game as well. Sharing your screen with your settings in your game like maxed out and your resolution at the highest possible is going to take a lot of your GPU usage, it's going to take a lot of your CPU usage, it's going to take a lot of bandwidth, and it could potentially impact your stream. So there are settings in there you want to change, and it's not just that. Now, I'm not sharing, I don't think, my screen audio at the moment. But of course, if you've opened up Rocket League, you know immediately music starts to play. So I've got music playing right now, and there's two problems with that. One, I find myself, if I was in a stream, having to talk over the in-game music, which is a problem. Uh, and also, most of this music is licensed, which means you may get a cease and desist or a you know no-no from there. Now, the good news about that is... When we get into our YouTube settings and we label our stream as for kids, it usually eliminates that because you're not doing it for profit. You're not, there's no ad revenue being generated. No ads will be shown. And so most of it becomes that sort of fair use gray area. Uh, and YouTube usually won't bother uh, to shut or restrict any of it whatsoever. Uh, it may not show up in searches unless someone knows specifically what link to click is the worst thing that could possibly happen but there's an answer to that too so let's look at both of those options as we go through how to set up our game and while he's doing that i'm yeah. going to remind folks uh be aware of the lyrics i i noticed the other day that not all of the lyrics in rocket league are school appropriate yeah, so they have leap stuff, but the themes are still the themes. Yeah, you know? <laughs> so I have turned off the the lead in music as I'm sitting in a room waiting and all that. Right, music. I've turned and, all of that off. Yeah, um, and that's exactly what we'll do right now. But there, there's more than one option for this. So Tammy, right. I, 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 you probably know it because you're on top of this stuff. But I want to make sure they see both options so they can decide. Because you may not talk during your streams. There are a lot of teams who want to stream out their game so people can watch it, but they don't have shout casters. The teacher doesn't want to do the shout casting or anything like that. They just want the game to be broadcast so people can watch it. Uh, in which case, watching it with no music could admittedly be a little dull. So we're going to look at what those options are. So right from the start, I'm going to go into my settings menu. Now, again, we're not going to use tonight to show how to set up your game, like for students to join. We've done that in the past as well. We're just going to go, this is all the stuff to do ahead of time. So I'm going to go into my settings. 
And the first place I'm going to go in all of my settings here is I'm going to go into video. And there's some things I'm going to change in video. Now we're going to be broadcasting. But to get a really good quality stream, um, especially when we're dealing with lower end potential machines in a school setting, when we're dealing with internet connections that aren't built for this, or you know they're considering this, or things are getting throttled, the easiest thing, one of the things we want to do is reduce our resolution. Now, we always want our resolution to match what we're going to broadcast at anyway, because then no encoding needs to be done in between that, meaning the software, the streaming software doesn't have to take a high end image and make it a low end image or take a low end image and try to scale it up to make it look better. We want them to match. So none of that extra processing has to be done. So we're going to change this to our 720p resolution, which if you're not sure, always look for the ones that say 16 by 9. 16 by 9 is your standard monitor size. It's your standard TV screen size. Um, so we're going to switch this from 1080 to 720. And I'm going to hit apply. When I do that, of course, it moved over to my other screen, and it's going to keep doing that. But I always have mine set on borderless. And what that means, essentially, is this is now in its own oh, come back window, separate. But since I have it small, I'm going to switch this to windowed and apply because now I can move this wherever I want. Now, I'm not going to worry about the fact that, hey, this isn't taking up all my whole screen. It's not going to screen, you know, stream properly. They're going to see this whole Windows interface on my screen. They're not. We're going to specify in our software what to share. So you'll see that in a little bit. Uh, we're going to turn off a bunch of these quality settings because, to be honest, these details aren't going to really come through all that well anyway. So uh, we're going to switch this from high quality to performance. Now, you could switch it to high performance. That'll take all those settings on the right and kind of turn them way down. Um, depending on how your stream quality is, these are things to play with a little bit. Um, again, for render detail, I'll switch it to performance. You notice all these things that get rendered kind of went away. It's just taking a little bit of the processing power for the game and removing it so that we can give some of that processing power to the stream instead. We're not gonna bottleneck uh, our CPU, our GPU. We're not gonna over flood it with processing um, requirements and requests so that it gets sluggish or we get frame rate chops and things like that. So we're just, if we do those two, it kind of adjusts all of this for us, which is great. Um, the other thing is this last one. It says frames per second. Now, when I play, I keep this uncapped. I want the highest frame rate possible. I want it to look silky smooth. I want high frame rates and my reaction time as a player are really, really good. But right now I'm not a player. I'm gonna be a spectator and streaming the spectator, you know, the, the view of the game. So I'm gonna switch this to whatever the frame rate is that I'm gonna share. Now, if I want it to keep it simple and I want it to stream really well, I'm gonna do that at either 30 or if I want to go up a little to 60, I'm not going to do any of these other numbers in between. First of all, uh, the YouTube max for streaming FPS anyway is 60. Same with Twitch. Um, 30 is your basic TV frames per second or movie frames per second. It'll look fine. Um, you can play with either of those. Um, I'm going to leave this at 60 for now. No big deal. That's all I want to change for my video settings. And I'm going to leave this window just running. I have it open on another screen. Having two screens for this is great. Uh, it's not a requirement. There is a checkbox we can use in OBS if we're only on one screen to make things easier. Um, but so far. Um, but yeah, we want to change that from uncapped. We don't want that uncapped. And by the way, this is a total sidebar. Uh, but the reason you keep that uncapped for players, even if their maximum monitor is 60 frames per second, still keep it uncapped because the reaction time of your inputs in Rocket League are directly tied to your frame rate. So even if it's not showing you all those extra frames, your reaction time from your controller, your keyboard will be better. They don't tell you that, but it is true. <laughs> but since I'm not a player, I don't need to keep it uncapped. Next, and this is where the big one comes in, we're gonna go to audio. And if we don't want all this music playing right now, this one right here that says music playlists, we're gonna turn it down. And oh my God, this already sounds so much better on my side because I was talking over all that music the whole time that you couldn't hear. Uh, but this helps. So we're just going to turn that music down. Now let's say I want the music, but the problem of course is the music I'm hearing, you're not hearing it, but if you went in the game, you know it, is licensed. So what if I don't want to share that licensed music, but I want music? 
down here second from the bottom is a checkbox that says streamer safe music. And all of this is public domain music, meaning it'll replace all the music in game with music that is totally permitted on YouTube. Uh, but again, like Tammy said, sometimes there's still themes and things like that we don't want to share. I usually go with just killing the music altogether, which means I'm going to uncheck this so I don't have to remember that later. <laughs> uh, player anthems are the music that plays from the students. Um, some of them do have licensed muted music. Uh, you can you can turn that off if you want to. Most of the time, it's usually just a small audio clip, so you don't get in trouble for it anyway. Not really an issue. Okay. Um, the last thing, and I find this one important, um, and I watch some streams where people don't do it, and I go, oh, I wish they had done that. Um, I mean, obviously, you want to teach your kids to not do anything stupid <laughs> in this sense or foolish, so you don't have to worry about this, but they're kids. Um, in fact, you know, I was watching a stream uh, some recently and saw like someone spamming the what a save, what a save, what a save. Now they weren't typing anything in the chat, but that can still be considered somewhat toxic behavior, especially when we're trying to build a community of, of positive play and a safe space for our students to interact and play these games. Um, so I go into the chat and I, um, I turn off, and these top ones for the record are the uh, quick chat settings, the text and quick chat. The bottom is the voice chat. I leave those to you. Uh, if you are in the spectator mode, the only other voices you will hear are other spectators. You may not want to hear their voices. If you don't, set this to allow voice chat to nobody, and then you won't hear anybody. Uh, up here, though, um, you're going to want to turn uh, all of this to off, off, off. And that way, that chat that's normally in the top left corner of the screen is just gone. It won't obscure the view of the game and they won't say something that you wish wasn't in your stream. <laughs> Although yeah. if you are in league play yeah, and you want to make sure you are seeing what your students and your opponent's students are saying, you may want to leave that on if you are recording Right. If you're if you're double dutying, right. If you're both the streamer and the one monitoring the game, then you may want to leave that on and keep that. And plus, then you got a nice recorded record of it, and they can't they can't pretend they didn't do it. <laughs> All right. I usually turn it off for the broadcasts, but I had multiple ways of interacting it, and um, usually I was co-hosting. Uh, Justin's not here today, but Justin was on a few of our calls and. Um, that way he had it open on his screen. I didn't have it open on my screen and somebody was looking at it at all times. So um, that's pretty much it for in-game settings. So I'm going to just leave that at that. Um, what I'm going to do though, however, is I'm going to just quickly set up uh, a custom game. Um, uh, let's just make this standard for now. just so that there's a lobby game open. Now, different stadiums do have different stadium noises. You can actually turn those things off. I like leaving them because it makes it sound like you're at a live arena event or things like that. But some of them do have music and not just cheering. This one kind of has like a drum beat until the game starts going on, but I leave that on, it's fine. Um, so I'm gonna leave that just on the screen there for now. From here, I'm gonna make sure we have YouTube ready to go. So I'm going to open up um, a YouTube channel. Now, this is my personal YouTube channel. Um, you're going to see all sorts of chaos on here, including information about ADHD, which my coworker, former coworkers, they're still my coworkers, I love them, are not going to be surprised about, as well as whatever Star Wars stuff and game stuff I'm following. But, you know, that's, that's fine. <laughs> but the button we're going to look for once we're in our YouTube channel is right up here, which says create, and it's got the little camera with the plus sign. Now, I want to preface this. If you are creating a brand new YouTube channel for this and you're going to go, oh, we're going to go live for the very first time, do not wait for the day of to do that because YouTube has a process that requires that you verify your account and it takes up to 24 hours to 48 hours to verify a new account to stream live. Which means if you wait till the day of and you've never streamed on that channel before and you're going to do it for the first time, it's not going to let you. <laughs> 
So make sure you're kind of ahead of the curve on that one, ahead of the game on that one, uh, and that you've done that already. You've tested a live stream long before you ever stream anything else. And I'm going to show you how you can actually test without anyone ever seeing it, because there are ways to stream live and no one can actually watch it. And that's what I'm going to do right now, because I don't want anyone watching our workshop stream, because <laughs> it's going to be weird. All right, so I'm going to hit that little create button right up here. And you're going to see three options. Create post, uh, which YouTube is, a, this is fairly new, last two years, where you can actually post like it's social media. So that shows up in your thread, that just images and posts. Uh, upload video or go live. Um, this one will possibly come in handy if you choose to use the OBS software to record matches in advance and then upload them. But we're, we're focusing on streaming today, so we're going to hit go live. Now, that will not make me go live immediately, so I'm not going to like panic. Oh, no, I hit go live. I'm going live. I'm not going live. We're going to let this load up. It does some buffering. It takes a minute. Okay. So it's basically ready, and this is going to just spin forever, because basically what it's doing is it's waiting to find a stream input coming from a piece of software, feeding it the live stream. But there's nothing doing that right now on my computer, so it's just sitting there spinning and looking for it. The first thing we're going to do is, and I always make this recommendation, is I'll show you how to set this up here, but know that there's two options. The option it takes you to right away is basically a way to set up your stream as if I was going live right now which we're going to use in a little while. Down below, however, um, there is webcam live streaming. As we said, there are built-in tools. That's kind of the built-in tool. I could stream with my camera or share my screen. It's really not great, but it exists if you need it. Uh, and then the one below it is manage, and it has a little calendar. I'm going to click that one because what that one allows me to do is schedule a stream. And this is where you see people that it says like, oh, going live like tomorrow at 3 p.m. This is how they're doing that. Uh, and you'll notice it's all the same settings we'll see in the one before. So if you need to plan it in advance, this is where you'll do that. I'm not going to use that for tonight. But I want you to notice it still has the option right here. And this is going to be one of our most important options that says, yes, it's made for kids or no, it's not made for kids. For our purposes, we are always going to check that, yes, it's made for kids because one, it's going to remove ads. Two, it's going to remove the chat, the live chat and comments. It's going to remove all of that. So you don't have to worry about managing it on the fly or anyone posting anything that you can't didn't see until later. So you don't have to stay vigilant on top of that because those comments are just off. Um, and anything that isn't kid-friendly won't come up. So even the recommendations, if they were to go to that link with no account, even the recommendations that come up for other YouTube videos are going to be other videos that are approved for kids. So it keeps it a little safe. Uh, so that's going to be a really important one. Uh, so I'm going to close this for now. And we're just going to go back as if we're creating a live stream right now. Now, the settings that I share in this one are the same ones that you would choose if you're just scheduling ahead of time. The, the only difference is if you schedule one ahead of time, you're going to click into that one and go live from there. It'll look just like this when you click on that like little calendar placeholder, and then you'll just go ahead and do all the steps that we're doing from this point on. You're just setting up all your settings and things in advance. That's all that is. All right, so I'm going to click edit. And this is where I can give it a title. I'm just going to call this testing Rocket League because no one is ever going to see it. Uh, we can give it a description. So, for example, if you've got a match between, you know, uh, Tammy's team and, you know, a Broward team or, you know, Wanda, your team and Tammy's team are matching up, we can put the names of the teams and the schools and where they're matching up and the Tammy, the, you know, the date of the game and, you know, best of five or whatever other details we wanted to add about the matchup. Uh, the league, you know, information, sometimes, e you know, esports league is part of that information or whatever else we wanted to put there. I'm keeping visibility private for now. <laughs> there are three options here. I'm keeping it private just because I don't want anyone to see this. This is just for demo sake. Um, the three options are private, which literally means I, I have to click here and invite people to watch it, meaning only people with a Gmail account who I invite are going to get to see this. That's it. No one else, even if they have the link, they won't see it. Unlisted means I can get a link from it and give it to whoever I want. I can share that link. This is one I know a lot of schools do use, meaning anyone with the link can watch it, but it's not going to be publicly facing, meaning anyone searching Rocket League, it's never going to come up for them. It's not going to show up on the channel as an upcoming live stream. 
it's only going to be there for people who have the link. So this is one that I know some schools have used because they felt it was kind of just an additional layer of safety. And then finally, public means literally anyone who's a subscriber to my channel, it's going to show live. If someone does a search for Rocket League SSL, SSEL or whatever, they might find it in their searches. Uh, that's what public means. Again, it'll still be for kids. They can't comment on it. They can't do any of that other stuff. Uh, but that's what public means. For now, I'm just switching it to private because I am not doing this. Next. Restrictions, I have this listed for made for kids. Now you can set your entire account to made for kids, which I have done with some of my accounts. And then it will always just default to this and you can't even change it if you want. So notice it says set by you, like, no, no, we didn't do that. You set your account to that. So it's always gonna default for that. And you can't change it unless you go in and completely change your account. And if you are using a school YouTube account, Google account, it is permanently set to made for kids. Right. If you've got like, if you're a Google district and they use mm -hmm. Google Classroom, it is defaulted and permanent made for kids, right? Broward, I know, is a uh, Microsoft one. So you'd be making your own. I know you've got Broward STEM accounts in there. And I've made a BCPS one, which I got to make sure you have. Uh, but yeah, that's where you'd put that. And again, the BCPS one is set to made for kids already. So good news there. You'll choose your category. Um, if you don't choose one, this is really funny, actually. It will look at your title and try to guess where it belongs, and it guesses wrong a lot. When I first typed in my title and didn't put a category, it actually thought this belonged in pets. Okay, but it's not pets. So you want to change that. And what's great is if you choose gaming, it will then ask you what title you're streaming. Um, and this is a drop down and if you start typing, so Rocket League 2015 is the game. Uh, you can do a thumbnail. So I used that image, but again, you can literally pull this uh, right from a folder on your computer. So if I wanted it to be that one, boom, thumbnail, whatever you want it to be. Um, if you have a playlist set up on your YouTube channel, like let's say I'm like, oh, this is my 2022, 2023 SSEL season games. I can create that playlist and I can say, you know what, automatically just when it's finished recording, put it in that playlist. I don't have a playlist for that right now, so we're going to leave it. The audience is, again, automatically defaulted to kids. This is where I can set that. If it wasn't default, I could still set it right here. Notice it says features like personal ads and chat will not be available. That's good. We want that. Um, this stream contains a paid promotion. What that means is anytime during your stream, if you're like, this was brought to you by haagen or this was brought to you by, you know, the folks at CDW or whoever, if there's a paid promotion, you have to let it be known that that's the case because it puts a little disclaimer at the beginning of the video down in the corner uh, that it includes a paid promotion or if you're being paid to do it. But that includes things like sponsorships. So be aware of that. Uh, it won't change anything. The only thing it technically changes is your ad revenue, but we're not getting any ad revenue anyway. So not a problem. Uh, automatic chapters, I usually leave on. It looks for audio cues and visual cues, and it makes chapters so that people can skip ahead in the recordings when it's done. You can just leave that on unless you want to make the chapters yourself, which is time consuming. Tags, this is where you will literally add words that are tags, Rocket League, Broward, Swanee, whatever it may be. Put those tags in there. Um, you can choose a language. This does make searching easier. Um, so if you're recording in a specific language and someone wants to search for it, uh, if I choose English United States, people in the United States who speak English are going to be more likely to see it. Uh, no captions. You can turn on things like captions. And there's a lot going on down here that you can add. Most of that, what we've got up here, is pretty much good to go. So I'm going to click Save. And so now I've got that information here and I've got this. Now, I'm going to open OBS, which I actually already have open because that's actually how you're seeing me. I'm sharing from my OBS camera. So this is actually the OBS software. And I've actually already created, uh, and that's what you're looking at right now. I've created a, um, a scene collection. And that's what this is called when I have different scenes that I'm going to toggle through or different slides or different images or video feeds or audio feeds or anything like that, that I want to be able to kind of use as different uh, screens in my production. So that's called the scene select or a scene collection. But I'm going to actually start totally from scratch on this. Uh, so you're going to lose my camera because I want to share this, but I want you to see how to set it up. And that's really important to know how to do. 
So I'm going to actually, you see, I'm, I've been doing virtual camera. If I stop that, you're going to see my OBS logo uh, as my camera, but that's okay. We're going to leave that just where it is. Uh, but you should still be able to see my OBS software and see me over here, right? Just making sure Tammy's nodding. That's good. So I'm going to go up to profile and I'm going to create a new profile. And I'm just going to call this one SSEL test. And you'll notice there's a little box here that says show auto configuration wizard. For now, I'm going to say yes, because these are the same things that's going to prompt you with the very first time that you open the software. So when you download it and you open it, it's going to take you through this process anyway. I want to walk you through it. So I'm going to say yes. I know how to do it already. I would probably have turned it off otherwise, but I'll leave it on. So, okay. So here's where we here's where things get weird. And you notice my camera got smaller. We'll talk about why in a second. What has happened essentially is I've created a new profile. It has defaulted back to 1080p, but my camera setting is at 720p because that was what my setting was for my last stream. So it just messed that up, but we're gonna see how to adjust all that stuff. All right, so you're gonna see, it's gonna ask you some basic questions. Optimize for streaming, recording is secondary. Since we are streaming, I'm gonna say yes for that and click next. Next, it says base canvas resolution, right? The current is 1080p, which is 1920 by 1080. I am going to change that. All I have to do is go down to this bottom one to 720. And then FPS, it says either 60 or 30, but prefer 60 when possible. That's exactly what we wanted. So that's what I'm going to pick are those two things and hit next. Next, it's going to say, which one am I streaming to? I'm going to do YouTube. RTMPS. Um, now, if I go to show all, there are other YouTube options. This is the one we want by default. Now, there are going to be two checkboxes here. The first one says prefer hardware encoding. We're going to say yes. Software encoding is going to take up more of your CPU usage and your GPU usage and means that additional software has to run. The only exception to this when you will say no is if you've got a really low end machine you're trying to stream from. But if you're running Rocket League on it, you probably have enough hardware to do hardware encoding. So we're going to assume we're going to leave it on. Next says estimate bitrate with bitrate test. And this takes a few seconds. You may want to try this just to see what your network connection is like. I have ones that I kind of play with and have defaulted to that I know work for me on my network. Uh, you may want to leave that on. I'm going to turn it off for now just because it'll take some time from our stream, but it'll run an auto test and give you an estimate. Now it's going to default to 2,500 uh, as our bit, bit rate. Some things to know, different screen share types require different bit rates. The reason I keep saying 720 and not 1080 is 720 streams well between 2,000 and 3,000, which is exactly what it defaulted to right here, 2,500. Uh, if we up that to 1080p, we're looking at a range of 3,000 to 5,000. Now, that's not impossible, but we know that our networks and our hardware aren't always the best with what we're working with at our schools. So I'm trying to give us the least common denominator just to get us started. For my computer here, I usually put this at around 4,500, even if I'm doing 720, because I still get a clearer picture out of it. This is a number you're going to play with as you test a lot, a lot, a lot. I will probably set this now to like 3,500 and go with it. The next it says connect account recommended or use stream key advanced. I am gonna tell you right now, this is the one time I disagree with OBS and I'll tell you why. If I connect my account, what I'm essentially doing is connecting this directly to YouTube uh, using my username and password and all of that information and giving YouTube permission to share OBS and OBS permission to stream to YouTube and all of that. The problem with that is somebody grabs my Gmail account. Now they can stream whatever the heck they want <laughs> on my account. Problem. If I use a stream key, I can delete that stream key and come up with and refresh and, and reset and come up with a new stream key anytime I want to. No username, no password required. So for security sake, even though it says advanced, I prefer the stream key method. So I'm gonna click use stream key. And my screen went a little weird there. Not sure why. Uh, it should have given me a place to insert that. Uh, where did it go? Oh, right here. It popped up at the top. 
Okay. Now, I will warn you, what I'm going to share with you now is hidden for a very, very good reason, because anyone with that stream key can stream to that channel. No questions asked. So you want to protect stream keys. They're important, and you'll notice that YouTube does things, and so does OBS, to protect those stream keys. So I'm going to go back to my YouTube page right now, where we're waiting to stream. Here it is. And you'll notice I've got a stream key right here. It's set to default. Now, what's great is we can create multiple stream keys. So I can create a new one, call this one OBS Studio. I can give it a description. We're going to leave it at RTMP. That's the default, and that's what we want. And we're going to hit Create. And what that did, you didn't see it on purpose, is it changed the key, the code that's underneath these asterisks. I am not going to hit this little eyeball to show it all to you because I'm sharing my screen right now and it's being recorded. No way, Jose, am I showing you that. But I can just hit copy over here so I can copy and paste it. So I can hit copy here and it says successfully copy to clipboard. I can go back to my OBS software and just control V on my keyboard. And again, look, all hidden. No one ever has to see it. And we're good to go. Hit next. And notice it automatically got all of the information it needed from that. It knows that I'm going to be using YouTube. It knows that I'm using the YouTube ingest server, uh, what I want my frame rate to be, everything, what uh, encoding I want, everything. We're going to hit apply settings. Good to go. Next, we're not done with settings in OBS. There are ones that I'm going to recommend you tweak. So I'm going to hit the settings button right down here at the bottom right. Now, by the way, right now I'm in studio mode. We're going to look at that in just a second. But for now, I'm going into settings. And that's going to bring up this dialog window. First, I'm not going to worry about most of the general settings right here um, with one or two different examples of things that you may want as a preference. So one, if you are streaming from a single monitor, just one, I've got two. I've got my OBS over here and everything I want to share on the other screen. That's how I usually do it. So I've got like my production studio on one screen and all the stuff I'm sharing on the other screen. But let's say you got one screen. There is a check here that says hide OBS window from the screen capture. And what that does is anything you're capturing in your screen, it'll capture everything except for the OBS software. It'll blank it out. No one will ever see it, which is great because you could have it open and no one will know you even have it open. It'll just share everything else. Uh, I don't do that because I've got two screens. The next one down here, these output ones, these are all confirmation uh, buttons. Basically, if I check these, if I hit start streaming, it will give me a prompt. Are you sure you want to start screaming or streaming? Not screaming. <laughs> yes, I'm sure I want to start streaming. And I hit yes. Um, I hit stop. Are you sure you want to stop streaming? Yes. You, are you sure you want to go live? Yes. Are you sure you want to record? Yes. Uh, I don't need those. I know what the buttons do. I turn them off. But some people like to have those prompts uh, and that extra layer of, wait, wait, I wasn't ready. Uh, that's up to you. That's a preference. The other one that you may use in the future, we're not going to deal with too much right now, is this. Uh, and this is the source alignment snapping. As we place things in our display and in our screen that we want to present, it's kind of like creating a PowerPoint slides. As we put things in there, this will allow us to kind of snap them to a grid. We can turn that on. We can turn that off. Um, we can change how much a uh, measurement or how how many like uh, pixels we want everything to snap, like in increments of 10 or 20 or 30. Um, the one that I would say you should always keep on is the one that says snap sources to edge of screen. Because that way, if you ever have to full screen something, you just drag the corner. And when it realizes it's close to the edge, it just goes boom, full screen. Because if you don't do that, you may end up with like a sliver of space you didn't see in your OBS software. And when you broadcast, there's going to be like this tiny line on the right-hand side or something like that that you didn't see in your setup uh, because it didn't snap and cover the entire screen. So I like that one a lot. All right, we're going to hit OK on that one. Uh, actually, I didn't mean to hit OK. We want to stay in our settings. We have a few more to adjust. Uh, we're going to go to Stream. Again, these settings are what we want already, so we're just not going to worry about that. It is going to give you a minimum and a maximum setting 
just know that these are the minimum and maximum that OBS allows and not the minimum and maximum of what your computer is capable of. My computer cannot handle 51,000 <laughs> output, even though I've got a pretty high-end computer. All right, we're gonna go over to output because there is one setting that we do want to change in here. And it's really, really important. Um, one, this is where we can change our, our video bit rate if we ever want to. So when we're playing with it, this is one we can play with. Two, you always want this one uh, to be on the H.264 enco uh, encoder. There are other options, like this is software encoding. This is hardware encoding. So when we chose hardware encoding, it set it to this. You can see it says hardware there. So make sure it's on that. Uh, this one, the encoder preset. This is one, again, you may have to play with depending on your hardware. What this is, is determines how fast it will do that processing. Slower is better. The slower we allow it to do that encoding and that processing, the better picture we get on the, out, on the other side of the stream. But know that that creates a delay, right? It has to do the processing. So if I go to fastest, that means like literally the second I say something, it's showing up in the stream. There's no delay, but it's not going to look great. If I go to slowest, it's going to take a longer time to do all the processing, but there'll be a longer delay. I prefer a delay. I think it's safer anyway, and your stream ends up looking better. But know that the farther you go down, the more processing it takes. So you've got to find like your happy medium for your device. Medium is generally a good place to start. And if then you can up it, then up it. If you can go down, go down. I usually keep mine at six right here because the high, high one has caused me some wonkiness. Um, down below is for when you use recording. Now, keep in mind, you can record while you live stream. So um, first, you obviously can tell it where you want to save any videos that you record. Um, you're going to choose what recording quality you want if you are going to use this to record. Again, higher quality means bigger file sizes, so know your hard drive space and things like that. Loss, lossless quality means picture-perfect recordings. Uh, those are going to be huge files, gigs and gigs and gigs for like a single video. I honestly think that high quality, which is just the medium side of the default, is perfectly fine, especially if you're going to upload it to somewhere like YouTube later anyway. The next one confuses people, and I want to make sure you are aware of it, because nine times out of 10, the default video format that we tend to think of is MP4, right? MP4 is like the go-to for everything. It's the Microsoft default one. It's the one we tend to convert things to. It's the one that uploads tend to ask for. It's the one that if we were doing it at a conference, they'd say, oh, can you put this in an MP4? Yes, we'll put it in an MP4 for you. Um, it's not what you want here. The one you want here is MKV, which can always be converted to any other format later. And I'm going to explain why very quickly. Both MP4s and the Apple equivalent, which is the MOV, which you can actually set this to also, do not encode the video or process the video until it is done recording, meaning it won't process the video until literally you've hit stop. Then it will go through some processing, and then your video will be ready. You've probably seen that in other software. MKVs process on the fly. It's literally like recording with a video camera. As soon as you record any footage, that footage, that footage is ready. Why you want that, and this is really important, is you're going to be doing long productions and probably recording some of them, you know, long broadcasts. If power goes out, if you lose internet connection, if your computer crashes or any other issue goes wrong, if you're doing MP4 or MOV, that video is gone. Every piece of it is gone. Anything you've recorded is gone. If you do MKV, whatever you recorded so far exists. And then you could just hit record again and continue. So keep it there. In fact, I think it warns you. If I do this and I go to MP4, yep, it totally warns you. MP4 MOV will be unrecoverable if the file cannot be finalized. So yeah, it, at least it warns you. That's cool. So we're going to keep it at MKV. Again, we'll use hardware encoding and we're done here. Uh, let's jump over here. Uh, I'm going to switch at the top one little thing. I'm going to switch over here, output mode to advanced. And we're going to do this for literally one setting and one setting only. I'll change my bit rate again. 
And we're going to change this one, keyframe interval. And we're going to change it to two. Now let's talk about what that is real quick. That is how many frames pass before it sends a frame to the stream. If you choose zero, that means it sends every frame you're recording to the stream, every frame, every frame, every frame, which means you're going to get frame drops because it can't keep up with that. But if you do two as intervals, it can totally process that and it has time to process it. And it gives you a little bit of buffer space if things start to get glitchy. So those two I would keep. You are going to have to change this bit rate again, and you are going to have to change. Oh, no, this is audio encoding. We, uh, encoding. we can leave that. Actually, I still prefer hardware encoding. There we go. 35, two. And again, you don't have to do this two frames. I just find it to be really helpful. Uh, and again, you have options. OK, and that's it. And again, you can adjust any of these settings. And you know, if they're too high and things like that, come back and play with them and see what your outputs look like. I highly recommend you do what I'm doing right now and just play at first. Don't say, hey, these are the settings. We're going to go live now for the very first time. Don't do that. Record the, the game screen, the home screen, whatever, and just go back and look at it. Look at your recording and say, or your live stream and go, did that look good? If it does, you're in good shape. All right, we're going to apply. OK, so now I've got everything the way I want it. Let's look at our OBS software. We have some options. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new scene selection. And my camera is probably going to go away when I do this. And we'll call this SSCL test again, test scenes. There we go. Now, what this is, and I know you can't see me anymore, um, this is where we create all of the different scenes that we want. So this would be things like the starting soon screen. This would be things like my game capture, my camera. Um, a picture in picture, a, you know, a title screen, a, you know, thanks for joining us screen, whatever else we want in our production. So let's add some things to our scene. All right, so we're going to start with a new scene. Um, and let's call this one our intro screen, or a starting soon, let's do starting soon, right, the very first thing we would put on the screen before we started. OK, and for starting soon, I'm going to add an image. So let me grab an image and I'll say create new image. I'm going to call this image starting soon. And I'll hit OK. Now you notice it also says add existing. Anything we add to any of our scenes, we can add it to other scenes too once we've created it. I'm going to say OK. I'm going to choose where my file is. And let's say I want this BCPS eSports one here to be my starting screen, right? Uh, and I'm going to hit OK. Now you'll notice it is not really well centered in my screen. So I'm going to grab, because of the file size, so I'm going to grab that corner and place it just like I would in a PowerPoint, exactly how I want it. And again, notice it snaps, right? It snaps to that side of the screen, right? So maybe this is the screen as they're coming in to watch the stream that it'll show. But maybe I want it to say starting soon. It doesn't say starting soon on here. It just says who we are. I can add that. So I will hit plus again. And I'm going to go to text. And just in the interest of time, I will just call that start. <laughs> right? And I'm going to hit OK. And it's going to give me a place to put in text. Uh, starting oop, soon. There we go. Uh, I usually leave an anti-aliasing on. It makes the corners nice and area. I can select different fonts if I want to. There's a whole bunch of fonts in here. Anything I want. That one looks kind of cool. Let's go with that. Um, I can transform that text, meaning let's say I wanted it in all lowercase or all uppercase. Also, Eric, you can also yeah. go in and fix starting where it's spelled right. Oh, yeah, I can. No, no, I like it like that. I was totally intentional. Uh, I can choose its color. Maybe I want it in a different color. Like, give me my color. Oh, is it going to make me put it in there? Oh, I'm hitting the wrong OK. That's why. Um, I can choose gradient fill, which is kind of cool. So it looks, you know, like these are things you can do in PowerPoint. Um, you can choose the gradient direction. So where you want it to come from, the gradient opacity. How clear do I want that to be? Um, a background color. We'll use that one in a bit if I have time. Uh, background opacity, things like that. Uh, alignment, let's say I want this centered. 
Um, and let's say I want it at the bottom. Uh, I also like when it has an outline. I think it looks cool. So let's select a color outline and make it black. Makes it pop a little bit. Uh, you can also choose how uh, thick you want that outline. And of course, this font is way too big. So let me go back up here, uh, go to select font and change my font size, because that is huge. And it gives you a visual of what it'll look like down here. So not great, but OK, we're just going to go with it. I can now drag this wherever I want. So I can put it there. Now, what you're seeing here is this is what I have queued up on the left. And this is what is on display, what everyone will see in the stream on the right. If I hit transition, it's now over here. Now, this is still showing this because it's what I have selected down here. I actually don't need this one anymore. So let's just delete that one. It gives you one by default. I don't need it. But let's add another thing to this. Let's add the game. So I'm going to start a new one that says, uh, let's call it gameplay. And in here, we're going to capture, there's a few different ways to do this. And depending on your hardware and how your encoding works, some may work and some may not. So you, there's a few different ways to make sure it does. So let's say we want to do game capture. Uh, we can call it game capture. We could call it Rocket League if we want. I'll just leave it at game capture for now. Um, we don't want to capture any full screen application. We're going to capture a specific window. Remember, we put Rocket League in a windowed mode. I, it's behind this stuff right now. I can't even see it. And we're going to find the Rocket League game, which is right here. And look at that. There it is. Now, there's one other feature you may want to get rid of. I always get rid of it because I can't stand it. But I watch streamers do it all the time, and it drives me nuts. You probably notice people, and you know they're streaming their game, and they got the menu up here. And you see their mouse moving around on the screen. OBS has a feature right here that you can turn off capture mouse. So. You can click on things and they'll never see your mouse. They'll just see the things getting clicked, but they'll never see the mouse moving around all of the screen. Or you may forget and leave it sitting in the middle of your match the whole time. And then they'll go, can you move the mouse in the chat, which you don't have a chat. Uh, so this way you can just, uh, and again, piece of cake, just make sure your mouse isn't visible to them and hit okay. So now when I'm ready to broadcast the game, uh, I can just transition from one to the other. And a lowest switch back and forth, whatever the last one was, in case you need to go back. Um, there are quick transitions you can change from cuts to fades and things like that. You can change the speed at which those happen. Uh, you can change some of the translucency between one and the other and do it yourself. Like this is a manual slider if you've ever used like a switchboard before for a, like a light board or a video uh, editing board. They've got like the manual slider. You can use the manual slider if you want. I never do. Uh, and you can choose whatever transitions you want. And again, you can select those transitions actually down here as well. You'll notice, however, there's no audio, right? I've got game, but notice there's no audio here. And anytime we want to add audio, we have to add audio to our scene. So we're going to go in here uh, and we're going to do two different audios. So first, I'm going to audio capture an input device and hit OK. I'm going to choose my microphone. And this way, I can shout cast now. Uh, and it would be there. Although, I don't know why it's not showing that in the mixer. I think it's because my mic is being used by, <laughs> by uh, Zoom. Uh, we can also share, of course, uh, the game. And things like that, and even just do the whole screen. Um, wherever your audio output is on your on your device. Oh, you know what it is, is I have to go into my audio settings. <laughs> yeah. And choose my devices. Because it's all disabled. So I have to set my mic. I should have told you this. So if I go back into settings and go to audio, I'm going to set my mic. Uh, I'm going to set uh, my desktop audio. And then I should be good. There they are. I apologize for not sharing that sooner. You do have to set your audio settings and choose which are your input and your output devices. And here you have sliders. You'll notice my mic is actually kind of redlining a little bit and spiking, so I can turn that down. 
Um, and I can test it. Check one, two, check one, two. Yellow spikes are fine. The black bar is actually your output. This is your spikes. Same over here. So maybe I want my desktop to be a little louder. You can adjust to those things. I'm going to leave them fine for now. Let's create one more scene. I'll call this scene, uh, we'll call this video. And in this one, we're going to capture our camera. So we're going to capture a uh, video capture device down here. And I'll just leave it as video capture device, but you can name it anything, camera one, camera two, desktop camera, Bob's camera, whatever you want. Okay. And there's mine. Now, you can go in and configure video settings on how you want it. I've got a green screen up, actually. I don't know if you knew that before, but you know it now. Um, and you can change a lot of things, whether this is your default, you can, um, and so on. You can customize this, and then you can change the resolution um, if you want the full thing in there. I like keeping this, and I'll show you why, uh, because it allows you a little bit more room to play. So I have switched my resolution. I went to custom and changed the resolution up to my regular output, which is going to be way too big for our 720 resolution screen that we're creating here. And that's okay. And we're also going to match the output FPS, meaning if we're outputting at 30 frames, it'll set my camera to 30 frames. If we're outputting at 60 frames, it'll set my camera to 60 frames. But notice this is way too big. What's good about this is I can actually drag it around. I can also resize it. And I can drag it exactly where I want it. And what this is good about is I can kind of zoom it to the point where it's beyond the screen. And that way, if I have any corners of my green screen that don't get covered by the screen, they're covered now. Finally, uh, let's add let's add a, um, a virtual background to the screen screen. And I know we may be going a little over time, Tammy. Is everyone OK with that? Otherwise, I can. Oh, I'm getting a thumbs up from Carolyn. Okay, I'll keep going. We're recording also. Well, I'll go quick. Oh, Eric, I would just push through as fast as you can, though. I've got like two more things to do, and yep. then we're done. So, but I do want to share this because it's one I know a lot of schools want to do the green screening stuff. So I want to show how to do it because it's a little tricky in here. So I'm going to first add whatever I want behind me. And that just means adding another image to my scene. I'm going to just call this one image. I will go and browse and let's grab that Rocket League image there. Okay. Now notice all I see is my image. Where did my camera go? Notice that the image here on my sources comes first and this comes second. These are layers. If I want the image to be behind me, I need to drag it below that. Now we still can't see it because my green screen isn't green screening yet. So I want to wipe all this green screen stuff out. Mm -hmm. The way we do that is I'm going to right click on video capture device and I'm going to go to filters. And I'm going to add a filter. The filter I'm going to add. Oh, wait, am I doing this wrong? Oh, no, effects filters down here. That's audio filters, wrong one. It is a chroma key. So I'm going to go to chroma key. I'll just call it chroma key for now. And this takes some work. There is no AI that's automatically going to detect your green screen. You have to kind of slide. So you do have to set it to a default or whatever here. Uh, you can set it to a custom. Uh, I do like doing select color uh, if you really know how to do it. Unfortunately, there's like no, uh, there is pick screen color and you can actually come up and choose like behind here. Uh, but right now it's all pixely because I have the green screen on, so it's not perfect. Uh, that did not work at all. So let's just set this to green again. Uh, and let's adjust the similarity slider until I get it just kind of where I want it. And what I'm looking for is to sort of black out this while keeping the front um, in there. And you have to adjust some of these sliders to get it. That will work. Boom. And now I've got the Rocket League logo thing behind me. Finally, we want to go live. And to do this, I'm going to just minimize this. I'm going to pull open uh, my YouTube video again, Oop, which is over here. And I'm actually going to shrink this window because we want to see everything here. So this is where it's waiting for start uh, a feed. I'm going to hit start streaming on my OBS. Remember, it already has the key. It's already connected to this. All I have to do is hit start streaming. Oh, stream key is missing. No, we did that. All right, let's open settings. Let's get the stream key again. Stream, view stream key, uh, copy, paste. 
apply. Okay, let's try that again. Start streaming. And it's gonna say connecting and you'll see it says start streaming and this green button here means everything is good. And you'll notice my stream is here. Now I'm live already. As soon as I hit start streaming, this went live. Now again, I'm doing it privately, but if I wanna to transition to me, I can hit this transition button and you'll see it's delayed right here. And I can say, hey, welcome to our game, blah, blah, blah. Here's me broadcasting, yada, yada, yada. Let's get to the match. I can come onto my OBS and I can go to the gameplay one right here, which you can see is queued up right here. I can transition over to that and that's gonna show up in my live feed as well. And you can see the video quality there and the, it looks pretty good. Not bad and it's streaming pretty smoothly. And that's that's it. When I'm done, I would hit stop streaming over here in my OBS software. And you'll notice over there, it'll say stream ended in just a second. As soon as it kind of buffers up. Yep, there you go. You get the little spinny guy. And then I can come over here actually, and I can just notice it says no data. This stream will end shortly unless you restart your software. I can just hit end, end. Uh, and then I can edit this in studio. I could add captions. I can add blur if I don't want something to be seen. I can do all sorts of stuff for the recording when I'm done. And uh, that's the big overall. So I powered through, Tammy. I powered through it. I'm going to start my virtual camera. So I come over here and I'm going to stop sharing Rocket League screen so I don't look like that. And I look like this. <laughs> and let's stop sharing my screen. Now, I know you'll probably have more questions about this, um, and that's fine. Is it still sharing? Oh, it stopped sharing my screen. Okay, good. Um, and that's fine. We can have future meetings. You can say, hey, look, we played with this. We got everything working. This still is weird, or our stream still looks really choppy. Uh, we would love to know more, and, and we'll follow up. Totally cool with following up. Everybody starts with a choppy st stream. Everybody. Always and forever. <laughs> So Wanda has raised her hand. Wanda, do you have a, a question? Quick question. Yeah. Um, I've been following, um, playing around, but when you know how you have your stream, you're you're at the end of your match, right? Mm -hmm. Is it automatically recorded? Like, so you put it later on your. It's going to record screen? everything that's in that game screen, and it's automatically recording. You can choose whether you want it to go into your channel, whether you want it to go into a particular playlist, whether you want to edit anything. Like maybe you, I had matches, for example, like you know last season, the season before, where the teams were just not ready, and I had that starting soon screen up for like forty-five minutes. I went back and chopped that off, like you know. Okay, so it records everything. It records everything. So you have to go in and it kind of reminds me of um, iMovie, a little interface. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Um, yeah, if you've done anything with like that, with Bandcamp, with that kind of things, they all use kind of similar interface in that sense. It's just obviously we're doing live streaming video. So it's more like a production studio sort of interface. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Carolyn. Carolyn. All right, so this probably is a, a real basic question. So I understood okay. everything we, we went, I understood everything we went through. How do I get the video from my game? Do I have to plug into the back of the Xboxes or am I oh, actually? No, for, for this one, I was running it on my computer and streaming it from the computer. Okay, so I have to enter the game like as a, player but right but you would player. go to spectate right and then you would just share that spectate screen okay i'm sure my kids can show me how to do that <laughs> they, they probably can now if you don't have a computer that can run the game and you're running it on xboxes and you still want what you would need is they make and it's external as a capture card so that you could plug the xbox into a computer and run it from there gotcha well i've i've yeah. got my personal laptop that's my gaming laptop so oh, I'm pretty you should sure be good from there it. yep yeah i'm pretty sure i'll run it i just i was a little bit disconnected at how i Oh, gotcha. I had it just up on my other screen on my computer. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. And again, all the kids who were playing with me, most of them were in Playstations or Xboxes or Switches or whatever. They were almost all on console. Um, I'm in as a spectator, but I'm doing it on my computer. So it doesn't matter what platform they're on. Okay, perfect. Yeah. We've actually started at my school, we've started streaming from a Switch. Uh, we have some, some higher end, because I'm a broadcasting teacher, I have some higher end equipment that I'm not going to get into here. <laughs> 
Right. But well, uh, a company to look at if you do need a capture card is Elgato it makes a really phenomenal capture card. Uh, they make an external one. So you can just plug it into like a USB port and then plug the console into that through HDMI. And it'll take that video feed and put it right into your computer. Yep. Any other questions tonight? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, thank you, Eric, for all of your support. Really do appreciate that tonight.